Welcome to Catholic Connection with Teresa Tamio, keeping you connected to your faith and your world. Teresa tackles the issues of faith and culture, the pro-life message, and media awareness. And now, here's Teresa Tamio. And it's a Thursday morning, December 3rd, 2015. Hope again that your first week of Advent is going well. We so appreciate your support and your listenership here at EWTN. We're continuing our taping of the next season of the Catholic View for Women. Catholic View for Women airs every Wednesday evening at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, and then it repeats on Friday mornings at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. And we now tape 26 episodes because Doug Keck said, you know what? You gals are doing well. We like you. Viewers like you. So we're going to give you an extra 13 episodes. So really, really appreciate that support. And so we are taping 2016 right now. We always tape in advance. And boy, it's been a whirlwind week. It's been very busy. On uh, Tuesday, we taped six episodes. Yesterday, we taped four episodes. I also had the opportunity to sit down with Doug Keck and greatly appreciated the the chance to talk about my new book that I co-wrote with my husband, Dominic, Intimate Graces. And did a bookmark with Doug yesterday. Doug's going to be joining us, as a matter of fact, at about 50 minutes past the hour for a big announcement on EWTN News Nightly and also an update on Mother Angelica, so you don't want to miss that. And then today we will record three episodes of The Catholic View. We're also going to be on At Home with Jim and Joy. So I'm very excited about that. Just love them. They're just amazing, amazing witnesses. And so it will be myself, Janet, and Astrid, the co-hosts of The Catholic View, will be on Jim and Joy's At Home with Jim and Joy Pinto. And that will be 2 o'clock Eastern Time on EWTN television. So make sure you tune in. You can also, of course, call in with your questions. We look forward to hearing from you. And I look forward to sitting down and being at home with Jim and Joy. We offer our prayers uh, to all the victims and the families in the um, latest uh, mass shooting that happened. And it's just, I don't know what to say, except Lord help us when you see something like that. 14 people killed, 17 others hurt. And uh, motives are still being investigated, and this is, of course, a huge investigation by both local police and federal authorities, and there's talk now that the feds will be taking this over if they haven't already. What's been very frustrating to me is the reaction of the media accusing the politicians who were tweeting out messages of prayer and support for the families and their victims, using it as as an opportunity to push their particular political agenda when it comes to gun control. Uh, The front page of the daily news this morning and i saw this story as i was uh, getting ready to come here and i'm packing in my hotel big 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 bold letters god can't fix this really i would like to introduce those editors to the lord i really would because the lord can fix anything with god all things are possible but it was meant at a shot across the bow to conservative candidates who don't want to change or add any more uh, gun laws or gun restrictions, and they use it as an opportunity to push agenda. When, you know, all of these these politicians were saying was, we're praying for you, and our prayers go out to the families and, and the law enforcement folks who are working on, on this case. And, of course, some decided, including some of the media, to turn this into an opportunity to not only attack Christianity, but to push a particular agenda. Very, very sad. But You know, in our local hour of the show, I was chatting with Father Frank Bavone of Priest for Life, who's our pastoral director for the Catholic View and who's with us this week. And he was calling Catholic Radio and TV a haven of sanity. And isn't that the truth? I mean, where else are you going to go and get the news and the activities and the happenings in the world from a truly Catholic perspective? And the Catholic faith is all about bridging faith and reason. And boy, do we need that more than ever. So Doug Keck will be with us, speaking of EWTN and the Haven of Sanity. That's at the end of the hour, at the top of the hour after the news, actually, about I shouldn't say top of the hour, about 14 minutes past, actually. We are going to hear from Dr. Ted Shree, who is a great witness. Of course, he's with the Augustine Institute. He's a well-known author and speaker. And it's an interview I did a few weeks ago with him uh, because he's on a, a much different time zone than us, and he is in Colorado, so sometimes it's difficult for us to have him online. We talked to him in addition to... Speaking to him about his new book, Love Unveiled, The Catholic Faith Explained, we also talked to him about pressure, and I think God's timing is perfect with us running this interview today, pressure from the culture to change our beliefs. 
and that's happening more and more. Then we're going to take a look at homeschooling with Maureen Whitman, the author of Why Should I Learn This? A Guide for Homeschool Parents and Students. And as I mentioned, we wrap up with Doug Keck, COO of EWTN. Right now at about six minutes past the hour on a Thursday morning, December 3rd, it is time to check the news and see what's happening in and around our world on a Thursday. So we'll do that right now. Authorities say the couple accused of killing more than a dozen people were well armed for the attack in San Bernardino, California yesterday. Former New York Police Commissioner Howard Safir telling Fox News the FBI will now probably take the lead in this investigation. The FBI has jurisdiction on all terrorism investigations. I think they're beginning to take over now, although there's not an absolute tie to terrorism. Investigators say Saeed Farouk and Tashveen Malik carried two assault-style rifles, two handguns, several magazines of ammunition, and an explosive device. They're accused of killing 14 people and wounding 17 others at a holiday party in the county office complex where Farouk worked. The ATF says he and Malik were tactical gear and each had several magazines of ammunition fashioned to their body so they'd be ready for a gunfight. The couple died in a shootout with police officers after their, they stopped their SUV. Meanwhile, a leading Muslim advocacy group is condemning the deadly shooting in California. The Council on American Islamic Relations calling the rampage a horrific and revolting attack. The brother-in-law of one of the suspects, Farhan Khan, saying he is in shock and cannot express how sad he is. He says his condolences are with the victims. Donald Trump is praising the police who are in charge of dealing with yesterday's mass shooting. In a rally last night in Virginia, the Republican presidential frontrunner honored the officers who put their lives on the line. This is when we appreciate our great police and our law enforcement. Remember that. Remember that. They don't get enough credit. They should get it. And you're always going to have some bad apples. You see it on television. Trump also held a moment of silence to honor the victims at the rally. Two suspects again killing 14 people and injuring 17 others before they were killed in that shootout in California yesterday with police. Some elementary students in New Jersey are in trouble, as Scott Pringle reports, after allegedly planning an attack on a high school. These five fifth graders have been suspended after police say school officials found a written note yesterday morning about them planning to set off an explosive device at Clifton High School. The fifth graders scheduled to go there for a field trip yesterday. Police did find this device. It's made of cinnamon and vinegar, and they determined it was harmless, but police say the intent was there. Juan has a grandson who goes to the school. And he didn't tell me nothing yesterday either. Yeah. Well, I'm going to find out what, why the principal, and I know the principal. She didn't tell nobody anything. Scott Pringle, outside School 11 in Clifton. The double amputee track star known as Blade Runner is apparently headed back to prison. A South African appeals court today finding Oscar Pistorius guilty of murdering his girlfriend, overturning the original finding of manslaughter. He shot Riva Steenkamp on Valentine's Day two years ago, 2013. He was sentenced last year to five years in prison but was released after 10 months to serve the rest of his sentence under house arrest. The prosecution expected to call more witnesses today in the trial of William Porter, the first Baltimore police officer to face charges for the death of Freddie Gray. Legal analyst Walt Warren Alperstein says prosecutors have quite the task ahead of them. You don't have to prove uh, that he did something wrong or he committed an act, but rather that uh, the defendant did not do something that he should have done. After opening statements were delivered yesterday, an instructor at the police academy testified that Porter received training on how to respond to medical issues such as Gray suffered in a police transport van after he was arrested last April. Porter is accused of failing to place Gray in a seatbelt in the van or call for a medic when Gray said he was injured and could not breathe. And staying fit and active during the holidays can be a challenge. Dr. Susan Joy with the Cleveland Clinic says the best way to shed those holiday pounds is to start your exercise plan before you put them on. I think it's probably a smarter plan to still have think three before minutes. the holidays about what you're going to do to try to maintain your fitness rather than wait till January and figure you'll just take everything away that you did wrong leading into the holidays. In addition to staying active, she says that exercise can also help reduce stress during the holiday season, whether your workout is high impact or low impact. She says any type of exercise is better than none. On average, healthy adults should aim for 10,000 to 15,000 steps per day. So there you go. It is about 10 minutes past the hour. It's a Thursday morning edition of Catholic Connection. You're listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network in this program, of course, a co-production of Ave Maria Radio and 
EWTN. Coming up in the program, we are going to be hearing from Dr. Ted Shree. We're going to talk about the pressure from the culture to change our beliefs, which we're seeing more and more out there. And I was mentioning this very, I think, nasty and really low blow that the Daily News took toward Christians, in particular Christian uh, candidates who were talking about calling for prayers for the victims and their families after yesterday's shooting. And on the front page of the newspaper, this major, major headline, God can't fix this. They just have to, you know, shoot one across the bow. Well, we'll pray for them too. But in the meantime, we continue to realize that God can indeed fix this and fix everything because he is Lord of all. And we await his coming right now in this beautiful season of Advent. So don't let all this news, bad news, get you down. We need to stay focused on Christ. We need to stay in the bark of Peter. And we need to remember that God is still in charge and that the world is a fallen place. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. And we pray for all the victims. And we even pray for the shooters involved in this horrible scene yesterday in San Bernardino, California, just as we prayed for all the people who were affected by that shooting a week earlier in the Planned Parenthood facility in Colorado Springs. We do live in a crazy world. And that's why we need God first and foremost, the teachers of the church. And of course, it's also why we need Catholic Radio and EWTN. It's a haven of sanity. Our phone number, if you have a question for any of our guests, 877-573-7825. Once again, you are listening to EWTN. We'll be right back with Dr. Ted Shree on a Thursday. I'm going to play a promo first to make up for you breaking kind of early, and then we'll be all good to go. Are people challenging your faith? Do you wish you knew how to explain it better? Well, then tune in to hear Father Mitch Pacwa and his guests, setting the record straight on all matters faith and reason. Next time on EWTN Live. Only on EWTN. EWTN Live with Father Mitch Pacwa is seen and heard around the world. For dates and times in your area, log on to EWTN.com. Good to be with you on Catholic Connection, talking a lot about marriage. Marriage and the faith in general, and of course the marriage issue on the minds of many with the Bishop's Conference what influence will the synod discussions, of course, the importance of marriage prep that came up during the synod. But this is all really in relationship to, obviously, our Catholic faith. And that's the reason we have Dr. Edward Tree back on with us this morning to really dive into his latest book, 
Love Unveiled, the Catholic Faith Explained. Now, you know Dr. Shree from his wonderful work at the Augustine Institute, uh, the number of beautiful series he's done, including Symbolon and Beloved, which just came out not too long ago, and, of course, his many books, his work on EWTN, radio and TV. But I want to dive into this book because there are so many things, and this is what Dr. Shree and I have been talking about, so many things that are pulling people away from the faith. And just recently, we had the latest numbers from Pew come out, which showed that people of faith, the religions are continuing in terms of the numbers to decline. Now, people who are strong in their faith remain strong and continue to practice. But the group that is growing the most is that group of nuns, as in N-O-N-E-S. And those are mainly millennials that are very easily drifting away from the faith. And unfortunately, a big chunk of those happen to be former Catholics. And sometimes when we're handing down the faith, and this is what we're going to talk about this morning with Dr. Shree, we forget that there are so many cultural forces that are pulling people away. So good to have you back on, Dr. Shree. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Teresa. Let's talk about that because it's very timely given what we just saw in the recent Pew survey that came out, I think it was last week or the last week in October. Pretty... Well, I I guess it is depressing, especially if you look at the growing group of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, and so many young people, the millennials, that are falling into that category. Why is that happening? Why are so many Catholics falling into those different categories? You know, I hear this so much from so many parents and grandparents that that are wondering what happened to to our kids, this next generation. You know, I I, I sent my kids to Catholic schools, or I I had them in a youth group, or, you know, they uh, they got confirmed. And then they, they reach their later teen years or, or their college years or young adult years, and they're bombarded by the influence of the culture around them. Uh, and it's not just the younger generation. It's, it's adults in general, too. We, you know, a lot of studies show that the people going through RCAA, you've probably seen this in many parishes, uh, one out of three people that go through RCAA stop practicing within just a few years. And so what, what's happening here? And I, I think... The analogy I like to use is this, it's what the church uses. When we pass on the faith, it's kind of like that parable of the sower, you know, so we're, we're sowing the seed, uh, but that's not enough. Uh, the church says we have to be mindful of the soil in which the seed is landing. And there's a lot of these cultural weeds out there that are choking the life out of the faith of the people we're serving, whether it's our own kids or grandchildren or, or the people in our parishes. Uh, what are those weeds? You know, so it, it's the relativistic mindset that we live in. It's the individualistic mindset. It's, it's the kind, it's the view of love. It's the view of tolerance. It's the, um, uh, the understanding of, well, we don't need a church even. I can just be spiritual all on my own. These are ideas that are just so prevalent in the culture. And no matter how orthodox we might be in our teaching, uh, no matter how much we're planting a seed and giving it a lot of water, if we're not aware of the weeds around that seed, it's going to choke the faith life out of our children, out of our grandchildren, out of the people in our Catholic schools, out of the out of the people in our parish programs. So what can we do or what can we be more aware of in terms of the culture? Because, you know, as you said, our faith, you know, we're not teaching our faith or we shouldn't be teaching it in a vacuum. Yeah, you know, let's take, for example, you know, take the moral teachings. Those are some of the hardest ones, you know, to go after in the culture. When we're passing on the faith, uh, again, whether at home or in the parish, it's not enough just to go, here's what the church teaches, and here's the five reasons why this makes sense. I mean, that we need to do that, of course. But what we should always be doing is saying, and in our culture, a lot of people say that there is no morality. I think we have to go after relativism itself, not just teach the, the doctrine, not just teach the right thing. And, and then point out, what happens when we live in a society that everyone just does whatever they want? Does that really lead to great tolerance and, and great love in a culture? No, because when, you know, the mindset of relativism is basically, you know, you can have your truth, I can have my truth. There's no the truth to which we're all accountable. I can make up my own morality. Don't impose your morality on me. But if I'm always making up my own morality, I'm always doing what I want. Uh, I, I'm, I always am doing what's interesting for me, comfortable for me, following my own personal values. You know, that, that's, that's going to make me settle in on my own self-centeredness. <laughs> you know, if I made up my own rules, I'd be a very selfish person. Uh, And God wants to call us out of that. He wants us to grow in love. Uh, But the culture of relativism leads us to a a kind of slavery, a slavery to myself. Uh, And I think we have to actually go out of our way and not just teach the moral truths, which we should always do, but we have to kind of start poking at relativism. Those are the weeds that are going to undermine people's faith. It it, it reminds me, 
Oh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, Sorry, Ted. Finish. Yeah, you know, there's a story I, I heard just a couple of years ago. A young college gal, you know, she she came from a good Catholic family, went to good Catholic schools. She went off to college, was practicing her faith, but then her second semester on campus, she was at a big party, a social setting, and, and somehow the topic of gay marriage came up. And she spoke about how, oh, well, you know, I, I think I think marriage is between a man and a woman. And everybody in, in, in this party on campus just started yelling at her and say, oh, I can't believe you're so intolerant. That's judgmental. Why are you self, self, self-righteous? self And they were yelling at her, and they literally kicked her out of the party. And she left that party saying, I, 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 don't, I don't think I can hold to these teachings anymore. It costs wow. too much. I'm going to lose my friends. And she stopped believing. She said, I, I, for me, I want to marry you know, someone from the opposite sex, but if other people want to marry the same sex, that's fine. And, then she, and that led her to justify a lot of other sins. And then led her to actually leave the church. She left the church for three years. Thanks be to God, she came back uh, right at the end of her senior year uh, through some e- evangelical movements on the campus. But uh, but the, the point is, the culture is so powerful. Here was a good gal going to daily mass as a college student. That's incredible, you know. Right. Uh, and then all of a sudden, she gets hit by this relativistic culture, and and her faith is gone for three years. Mm-hmm. We've got to be mindful of those weeds. And, and, you know, the surveys are showing that more and more Catholics are accepting all kinds of situations, including thinking that there's nothing wrong with two people of the same sex being married. I mean, the numbers the numbers are pretty high in that category. Yeah, so, you know, the whole area of sexuality, right? I saw a study recently, I think it, I think we're looking at the same one, the Carol Report here, that showed that almost 50%, I think it was 48%, of weekly attending Catholics. This isn't just like the Sunday or the, you know, the Easter Catholics. These are ones that are committed to a certain extent. They're coming to Mass every week. Almost 50% of them think it's okay if, if someone's cohabitating and they receive communion. Like there's no moral issue with, you know, premarital sex. No moral issue with cohabitation. Uh, and that's, that's not just from the culture. That's not just from the fringe Catholics. That's from the Catholics that are showing up every day in our pews. So once again, we, you, know, you see the cultural influence. These are people coming to Mass. They have some sense of Catholic value, but yet it's, it, it's so influenced by the culture around them. But So how do we break through that? Because obviously if they're in Mass, they're not getting a message. So uh, it's probably a combination of things that these issues, if you're only going to hear from the pulpit, and there's a lot of things the priests have to talk about, and they have to, of course, teach uh, on the, on the uh, Gospel, the, the, uh, the readings for the week as well, uh, try to tie them into what's going on to the world so it's relatable, uh, but they have specific guidelines that they're encouraged to follow when they're preaching and teaching from the pulpit. But if they're only in Mass once a week, they're getting influenced by what's out there in the world every single day, and so the faith is just something that they do on Sunday. So how do we break through to make it more real and something that, that we have to do every single day? Exactly. You know, they, they get a 20-minute homily at best, You know, maybe 10 right. minutes. Uh, and they're spending dozens and dozens of hours with the secular world. All yeah, the about time. 40 to 50 hours. <laughs> children spend, exactly. young people spend about 56 hours a week with media. That's children in grade school and high school. There's a new survey that just came out this summer from Baylor showing that college students are addicted to their cell phones, and this is college students overall, spending anywhere from 8 to 10 hours on their cell phones every day. And then you have the adults who are spending about uh, between 45 and 50 hours with media. A week. Yeah, so think about that. I mean, we're, we're, to just preach, here's the teachings, isn't enough, right? That's why we have to go after it. You're going to be hearing. You know, if you listen to the radio or you, you, you know, turn on a, a YouTube video or you're watching TV, you're watching a movie, you're going to be bombarded with these other messages. That's the point. I think we have to make the biggest bang for the buck, whether I'm a lay person talking about the faith with my kids or, or I'm, a, I'm a deacon preaching at Mass or I'm a catechist in my parish leading a Bible study or RCIA. Uh, I, I, I have to give the biggest bang for the buck in the short time I have, and I need to prepare them, let them know this is what you're going to hear. It's kind of like, you know, when you do immunizations, you get, you know, many times you get a little taste of the bug a little bit, so that your, your cells start noticing it, so when you catch the re- real bug, they can go after it better. That's what we want to do. We want to tell people, so, you know, let's just take, for example, this issue of, of love and sexuality, which is, you know, you know, to just stand up and say premarital sex is wrong and here's three reasons why. That's not enough. We got to, you got to go after and say, look, in the culture, you're going to hear this. Everyone thinks that love is about just feelings or about pleasure. What do I get out of this other person? And if I get a lot of big feelings and I have a lot of fun times, then I must be in love. Well, we know from our own experience that doesn't work. We're longing for something more, real love, and we point out what that is. 
is, is to will the good of another, to seek what's best for the other person. It's modeled by Jesus Christ. It's about sacrifice and commitment. And in the end, that's what we all want. I don't want to just have a fleeting, fun time, like going to an amusement park with somebody. I want to be known. I want to be loved for who I am, not for what I do for this other person. And, and Because if I'm just loved for what pleasure I give this person, what fun times and feelings I give this other person, what happens when those feelings fade or those fun times go away, which they will eventually? Then the other person is going to leave me and go for someone else that's going to be more fun and more interesting and more pleasurable. Uh, and so I think it's not just teaching premarital sex is wrong, but actually going after what are you going to hear in the culture? So that then, when, when they are confronting that, their antennas are up a little bit more. Uh, and that, it's kind of like pulling those weeds out before they start choking the plant of faith. If you're just joining us on Catholic Connection, having a great conversation with our friend, Dr. Edward Shree from the Augustine Institute. We're diving into his latest book, which is really, really well done, Love Unveiled, The Catholic Faith Explained. We'll wrap up our conversation with Dr. Shree when we come back. You're listening to Catholic Connection. Stay tuned. Okie dokie. Andrew? Yes? How's it going back there? In terms of the drive? Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. I gotta be in here staring at Nobody the seems to know anything. Well, they don't tell anybody anything. They don't, they don't have the number out or anything. All they do is ask for phone calls. They never say how much money we need. They're like, oh, we want 10 calls this hour. It's like, well, what the hell is that going to do? It's like... I emailed you yesterday um, with what I knew. Yeah, yeah I um, saw that. And that's pretty much from when <laughs> Mike went in to talk with Al. I went into Mike's room and looked at the computer <laughs> and did some math. Because it's not... I mean, if we, we keep talking about how we're being, you know, really open about this, but no one's, no, no one's saying anything about what the goal is or how mm-hmm. we're doing or anything. I don't think they realize that these are shorter days. And uh, ending the pledge drives at five o'clock, we gotta you know, start this countdown a little bit sooner than you know Thursday afternoon. Mm-hmm. And it's so note the emphasis is on uh, getting calls as opposed to money. We always ask, we always have like an hourly goal in terms of money. Like, oh, this hour is 5,000, this hour is three, whatever. But right now it's like, we want 20 calls. Like, well, what if you only give a dollar? It's like, mm-hmm. you got 20 bucks. And, but you, you met your goal, but you got 20 bucks. I don't, I have no idea. So this last, next segment is coming up here. If you were to walk into a coffee shop and randomly ask folks, hey, what does the Catholic Church stand for? What kind of responses do you actually think you would receive? Some people might talk about the rituals of the Catholic faith. Others might mention the Pope or the Blessed Virgin Mary. A large number would probably focus on controversial moral issues of our day. The Catholic Church is against abortion, contraception, and against gay marriage. Few, however, would get to the heart of the gospel and say, the Catholic Church stands for the God who is madly in love with you, who has a plan for you and wants you to be happy. The God who even sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, who wants to forgive you and help you in your life, and who most of all wants an intimate, personal relationship with you so that you can be with him forever in heaven. Reading from an excerpt of the wonderful book, Love Unveiled, by our guest, Dr. Edward Shree. The subtitle is The Catholic Faith Explained. Boy, if that isn't true... You would hear all kinds of things, but I doubt, and I think that is a sign of the fact that people obviously haven't gotten the message. Exactly. You know, what's interesting is it's not just if you go into your local grocery store or, or, or Starbucks and ask that question. If you ask the average people coming to church on Sunday, what does Bingo. the Catholic Church stand right. for? They're going to say the same thing, right? I, you know, I, I meet so many adult Catholics that, you know, they admit, you know, I, I don't really understand the church or, you know, I know that there might be Ten Commandments and Seven Sacraments, but, you know, I, I don't really know how it all fits together. Uh, and, and that's what I'm trying to do in the book. It's a walk through the Catholic faith, 
uh, you know, really practical, how to live it deeply in our own lives, a lot of encouragement in there. But the biggest thing I'm trying to do is, is, is cover what we've been talking about here. How do we understand and present, defend, explain the faith in light of all of these cultural questions? You know, right? We're not teaching in a vacuum. So there's all these influences out there, all these weeds in the soil that's trying to choke the life of the plant of faith, the life of faith in us. Uh, and in the, in the people we serve. And, and so we need to be able to go after the faith, pass it on to the next generation in light of all of those weeds. And so that's why every chapter of the cover, you know, we cover the sacraments, the book, we cover everything from the Bible, Jesus, purgatory, Mary, uh, and all the moral issues, Catholic social teaching, sexuality, human life issues, prayer, all these things. But we're constantly bringing it back to what's out there in the culture that's going to undermine my ability to live out the mass or to live uh, my relationship with the church, or to to really trust the Bible, or or to, to 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 live out these moral teachings on sexuality, or to even believe there is a morality. How can we go after that uh, uh, in anticipation of what people are going to be bombarded with from the culture? Uh, yeah, I keep going back to what you said. I keep thinking about what you said before the break when you were talking about the people in church, and I find that over and over again. There was an experience earlier this summer that one of my neighbors shared with me after coming out of Mass on 4th of July, and of course this is right after the Supreme Court decision on marriage, and the pastor gave a wonderful homily about religious freedom and talking about not only the decision, but talking about that couple in Portland who lost their bakery because they wouldn't bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple, and it was a really powerful, powerful homily. And so my neighbor was telling me about it over the fence and said, this is a great homily, you have to look it up because this uh, parish records all their homilies. And he said, but what was even more interesting was on the way out, A man said to him, another parishioner said, I don't know what Monsignor was talking about. What do you mean we have a problem with religious freedom? We just got done with Mass. What's the big deal? Everything's fine. And so that mentality, Ted, of people thinking that as long as I can go to church, then that's all I need to do. Then we have religious freedom and I have everything I need. I just check off the box. Uh, that's just freedom for worship, yeah, which actually is some of the, some of the movement in <laughs> secular culture is to go in that direction. Uh, yeah, but yeah, religious freedom is much broader than that. Am I actually free to practice not just worship in the privacy of my own home or at my own parish or in my own heart? Uh, that's one thing. That's just freedom of worship. But freedom of religion is actually my ability to live my faith out uh, in, in the culture. Uh, am I going to be... Uh, you know, not tolerated for belief that marriage is between a man and a woman? Am I going to be punished for uh, wanting to be open to life and having children? Am I going to be punished for believing uh, that uh, that abortion is wrong, all these things. And as we're seeing more and more, like the example I gave of that college student earlier, or we could all we all have our countless examples, it's hard to stand up and, and, and live our faith and, and, and present it publicly. Uh, in a loving way, of course, and, you know, accepting of all different peoples and traditions, of course. Uh, but yet, if I actually dare to say, I think abortion's wrong, or I think marriage is between a man and a woman, if I, if I dare to say something like that, I'm not going to be tolerated by culture, right? I'm going to get a slap on the hand. People are going to say, I'm rigid, you're a fundamentalist, you're judgmental. Uh, this is what Pope Benedict was talking about when he talked about the dictatorship of relativism. You know, relativism isn't just, you know, a nice, neutral view of, oh, everybody you know, has their own views, and we should accept everybody. That's not actually what relativism is. Relativism is there is no morality, and if you think there is, you are going to be marginalized, we're going to punish you, you're not going to be tolerated in this culture. Uh, and that's a big piece of what I'm trying to do step-by-step step throughout the book uh, is to show the Catholic faith is all about love and, and to show how the Catholic faith actually is the way to full happiness in light of all of those relativistic questions and, and addressing them step-by-step. Step. And that's so, so important. Now, in the book, do you give resources for people? Obviously, you're quoting a lot of great documents and church teaching and, and scripture, but are there resources there for people in the book if they want to follow up? Well, you know, the biggest thing is the book is based off of the Symbolon series, uh, which is a video series the Augustine Institute put out that you involved with, Teresa, and, and many other great teachers, dozens and dozens of teachers. I was blessed to be the host and the, the content director for the program, and it's a video walk through the faith, where we filmed at Rome, Holy Land, and Calcutta, India, and then brought in, you know, people like you, people like Patrick Coffin, Janet Bankovic, and Jason Christina Ever, Chris Stefanik, Tim Gray, and, uh, and so many other people around the country to, to walk through the faith. And you know, it's a wonderful series that's being used in over 4,000 parishes already at its first, you know, a little over a year now, uh, being used for RCIA, adult faith formation, small group, uh, studies, 
men and women's groups, and uh, catechist formation. And so uh, the book is based on that. Uh, certainly, it, the book would be a great resource. You know, if someone likes the book, uh, in fact, just this weekend I was speaking at a couple places, and many people bought the book, and they asked, you know, are there other resources, and, you know, I shared with them what symbol on it. So a lot of them, I think, will go bring symbol on back to their parishes or their small faith communities, and, uh, and so they can go together, but the book also stands on its own. It's just a resource that will read for their own edification. Yeah, but, but I think this is so important because you can use one to back up the other. You know what I'm saying? You could watch Cymbalon, then read the book, or read the book, and then watch Cymbalon. But I guess getting out of this mindset of just being in Mass every week as, as if that's enough. Now, obviously, the Mass is a source and summit of our faith, but it's just so frustrating to me that we've gotten into this just rut and this rote practice of thinking that's, that's all we need to do. But it's more than that. When we... The biggest, my, my husband always says that the most important point of the Mass is the end of the Mass when you're sent out. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah, we're sent out. We're being sent out into a world that desperately needs the witness of Jesus Christ through us faithful Catholics. I often like to speak about the virtue of magnanimity, which means greatness of soul. It's a desire to, 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 to for one's own excellence, to give the best of myself for God and for others, not for my own sake, but really for the common good. And God put us in this time here, you know, in a, in a very difficult situation in the culture. Uh, but, he, but he gave us the faith. He put a good priest in our life or a good parent or a good friend that, that brought us to a conversion. We actually believe. And yet there are so many of these faithful, believing Catholics that all they do is they, they just go to Mass and they just go to, to parish to be fed for themselves. I like Bible study for me or I like to watch EW10 for me. And that's fine to find that enrichment. But let's take that faith and go outward and share it with others. Amen, which is what we're called to do. Dr. Edward Shree, his latest book, Love Unveiled, The Catholic of Faith Explained. You can find it on his website, edwardshreesri.com, edwardshree.com. We'll be right back on Catholic Connections. Stay tuned. Okay. Okie doke. Yeah, she's on hold, but if you talk to her, it'll go over the air. Yeah. Yeah. On the Mm -hmm. YouTube thing. So Doug is supposed to be coming in. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just telling you in case something (laughs) happens, you call him on his cell, but I'm pretty sure he's, because I just spoke to him about it yesterday and confirmed it. Elena, if we don't see him by like um, 45, maybe you could. I'll go out and yeah. send a search party. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, you bet. <laughs> search and rescue. Search and rescue. We'd like to say hi to our YouTube listeners who <laughs> can hear us during the yes, break. Hi. <laughs> we know that uh, Red Wing Ed is listening because he's oh, chimed Red in. Wing Ed. Yeah, hi, yeah. Red Wing Ed. So he must be a Red Wing fan. <laughs> I'm just saying. Nothing gets by this investigative reporter. <laughs> who else is tuned in? Do we know? Oh, um, we'll we'll get a list. We'll get a list, definitely. We had a little more than 15 countries tuning in yesterday. Awesome. Um, Almost 100 people. Yeah. Wow, great. Here we go. Welcome back. It's Catholic Connection, a co-production of the EWTN, Global Catholic Radio Network, and Ave Maria Radio. Teresa Tamio with you, and... 
I am in Birmingham, Alabama, taping another season of The Catholic View for Women, and love being here to see all my friends and family, including my sister Elena Rodriguez, who is uh, holding down the fort for me down here. Andrew, of course, as always, is doing a great job back home in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Elena, we're also being carried on YouTube now, aren't we? That is correct, and our folks can see the show and watch Teresa. I'm waving. I do the queen wave. Queen wave. Elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist. There you go. There you go. With your beautiful TV makeup. Thank you. And I'm Essential. so glad that I was able to get my makeup done before I came in yes. here this morning. So yes. see it all works out. God is good. EWTN radio channel on YouTube. Okay. So we had uh, quite a few yesterday, I understand, right? Oh, Never yes, mind. we did. Uh, we had more than 15 countries tuning in. Wonderful. It's a big number. That's so. great. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we will uh, keep you posted, and you'll keep me posted how many countries are following this morning. So that's awesome. Exactly. In the meantime, we have to go back to our program, which is Catholic Connection. And this is a topic that I'm sure is near and dear to many people's hearts, and that is the topic of homeschooling. Maureen Whitman, and the book, of course, is actually it's a really, really cool book because it's a compilation of some great essays from some amazing people that you well know and love, including Joseph Pierce and Mike Aquilina. The book is Why Should I Learn This? A Guide for Homeschool Parents and Students. Hey, Maureen, thanks for joining me. Hey, great to see you. How are you? Or not seeing you. I'm not on YouTube. <laughs> great to hear from you. <laughs> or you, Teresa. I'm good. And and it's really, I think, an important topic because my, my husband and I were never blessed with, with, uh, with any physical children. We have all kinds of spiritual children. But I always say, yeah. boy, if, if I did have children, looking at our culture the way it is now, I certainly would at least give homeschooling a, a serious, serious consideration, if not dive in fully. To me, Maureen, I I have to, parents raising kids today out there in this world, I I just, I pray for them. I I admire them so much because they are up against so much. Are you seeing um, an increased interest with everything that's going on, even in the last year or so, in homeschooling? We are. I've been getting a great increased number of phone calls over the past year or two, uh, especially with a lot of changes we're seeing towards uh, in the culture, also Common Core being introduced into Mm -hmm. more school. I'm getting more and more phone calls from parents who are just looking for another way. And and what are their greatest concerns when they call you and say, I really think that we need to do this, but I don't know. Is it that they don't think they're qualified? What are some of the issues that come up? The, what are their concerns about whether or not they can homeschool? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, well, whether or not I'm qualified, of course, is a big one. Can I do this? Uh, and the answer is yes. If you're, if you're really looking for God's will in your life, no one loves your child more than you. And the resources are out there for you to be successful in homeschooling your child. You're going to make sure, as their parent, that those resources are found and implemented. And the studies show us over and over again that homeschooled children do fare well. They, in fact, do better academically. They do better socially. Everyone asks, talks about socialization, yet formal studies have showed us Homeschool children are better socialized. They're more engaged in their local communities, um, et cetera. So, yes, you can do it. You are qualified as their parent and through the grace of marriage. How, what if you have special needs children? I would say homeschooling is even more important. I, I Personally, I have a house full of, of special needs children. Uh, for example, my oldest son is severely dyslexic. And if I had kept him in school... They don't even test children for dyslexia until they're two years behind. And typically, Mm -hmm. dyslexic children have a much higher rate of high school dropout, a much higher rate of delinquency. By homeschooling him, I was able to work with him one-on-one, give him the attention he needed. I was able to use a multisensory approach, which works for dyslexic children, because I did have more time with him. I had the resources to do it. Uh, For an ADD child, for example, uh, you know, you can shorten lessons, 20 minutes a lesson. There are many things you can do to help that child because you're working with them one-on-one. So I would say homeschooling is better in most cases for a special needs child. So does the book actually help them get started in addition to the great essays from some pretty prominent uh, Catholics such as Jennifer yeah. Fulwile, Joseph Pierce, and others? I know that there's it, it's just chock full of, of great um, commentary. But what's in there in terms of helping them get started? Well, the, this book is a little different. It, it's not a how-to-get-started book. Okay. You would look to another book. For example, I wrote a book called The Catholic Homeschool Companion, something like that. Why should I learn this? It's more about why should I learn specific subjects? Why should I learn philosophy? Why should I learn 
formal logic. Why should I learn algebra? <laughs> you know, uh, in fact, uh, Dave. I wondered Omar that when I was in high school, I have to say more. <laughs> yeah, why should I learn algebra? Where am I going to use that in life? Well, you know what? Every time you cross the street, Teresa, algebra saves your life <laughs> because you have to estimate how fast that car is coming at you, how far it is across the street, and how fast you can run. And <laughs> you need to put that all into an equation. And that's an algebraic equation. And you're able to do it mentally because you learned algebra, and it all comes to you fast. So, yeah, you, algebra is necessary. And we do mention that in the book. It is one of the, the essays. So who is the book for primarily, those parents who are already homeschooling, those looking to homeschool, those who well, have homeschooled and, and, and trying to want to just kind of revisit the topic and, and, and spread the word about homeschooling, or all of the above? Yeah, all of the above. We wrote it for parents and students both. We wrote it in a way that a parent could give it to her child. So the child does say, why should I learn algebra? Why do I need to learn formal logic? A parent can hand that to a child. Interestingly enough, I'm on the school board for the Lansing Diocese, and mm-hmm. I gave the book to the, my fellow board members, and a couple of them came back to me and said, wow, this is a really terrific book. So it would even be good for uh, teachers and parents of children in in Catholic school or public school as well, because we're just talking about why these subjects are important and why you should take time to learn them. In terms of the culture, what do you think parents are most concerned about right now? I know there's been a big, a bit a big push since the whole uh, so-called same-sex marriage issue came up in the Supreme Court, right. and also, of course, the transgender issue. There seems to be more and more discussion about indoctrination of young people in the schools on these various topics. Yeah. I, I got a lot of phone calls after the Supreme Court decision from parents, and, and not just parents wanting to homeschool, but parents whose children are in public school and need some resources to help them build their children's faith, faith, help them to defend their faith. So we even have public school children who are taking our online classes to help them with that. So they're looking for apologetics, looking for philosophy, and even looking for, you know, history classes with, uh, they're taught through our Catholic lens, or, you know, other subjects. They're always bringing in Catholic church teaching because our faith is something that should be part of everything we do in our everyday life. So shouldn't it also be a part of all of our school subjects? So yet parents' main concern is, will my child be able to defend, <clears throat> defend their faith? Maureen, thanks for joining us this morning. I wish we had more time, but we have some uh, news we need to get to with uh, Doug Keck from EW10, so we'll have you back on. The book is Why Should I Learn This? A Guide for Homeschool Parents and Students. How do we find it? Uh, just search Amazon or email me at homeschoolconnections at gmail.com. All right. Keep up the great work. Why Should I Learn This? A Guide for Homeschool Parents and Students. Maureen Whitman, our guest up next, the one the only Doug Heck, who's in studio with me this morning, has some breaking news to report, some good news for a change. And, boy, we could use some good news, especially with all the news that's out there this morning. We'll be right back. It is 47 minutes past the hour. We're also being carried live on the YouTube channel for EWTN this morning, which is a lot of fun. So smile, Doug. You're on candid camera. Right there. See? There it is. Wave. Hi. Hello. Out there in YouTube lab. <laughs> we'll be right back with Doug Keck here in studio on a Thursday morning. You're listening to Catholic Connection on EWTN. Stay tuned. Okie dokie. I don't hear you anymore. It's because I'm off mic. I'm right here. Um, 
Do you hear me? That's what he says to me. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you're from... Well, as long as we're okay. I see you guys talking on the screen, but... Yeah, I have their mics down. But I will pot them up as soon as we come back from break. That's 10 seconds from now. 10 seconds. Hey, there's some pretty jazzy music for Doug Keck in studio. This is fun. Normally we're on the phone. Yeah, it usually runs counter to my style, that's for sure. <laughs> I, I'm not as hip as, as, as your show is. Oh, here. sure you are. Very staid, book You're a, you're a very hip guy because you're from New York. Of course. of course. There you go. All right, so we do have some uh, good news to report this morning. I think, boy, can we use some good news after the story that broke yesterday. You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, one of the things we announced yesterday, which I alluded to when we talked a little bit on Monday, was mm -hmm. the fact that we're, we're proud to announce that Lauren Ashburn is our new White House correspondent, going to be heading also director of our political uh, group awesome. as far as their, yeah. uh, you know, very important going into the 26th election cycle. And she'll be, uh, you know, she's a Washington veteran for over 20 years, uh, has been on Fox, has been on CNN. Uh, was with uh, USA Today and uh, Gannett uh, for their television side uh, when they were feeding out uh, stories to their uh, regional stations and affiliates. And so she's got a, a good breadth of knowledge. Uh, and also, importantly, which is really important to us, she's also a very pro-life person mm. um, who's uh, got, uh, uh, you know, a sense of the faith, is a committed Catholic, wrote an article a couple of years ago about how tough it was to be somebody who uh, could wear their uh, crucifix in the, in the office newsroom. in the yeah, newsroom yeah, and yeah. not be given mm -hmm. a hard time, and, and how difficult it is uh, in that way, uh, I think in ways that somehow people kind of sense it's like that, but they don't realize how bad oh. it really is. Uh, so I can't wait to talk to her because right. I, mean, I know that we're going to try to get her on the show at least once a week to do updates, but I just can't wait just to chat with her as a fellow right. sister who has been out there in the secular world and had those same challenges. Right, and it's great, I think, because, uh, you know, uh, the whole team of News Nightly has done a great job of building that show up over the last couple of years. We've got a great young team. Um, they're now uh, sort of seasoned veterans now, but we're we're happy to be able to bring in some additional uh, talent. Uh, there's some uh, also a, a, a producer who had worked for AP for about 20 years we, we see coming on to help at the White House. We're going to have a whole White House team there. Uh, we're also uh, going to be hiring. We have hired a couple of other uh, people with extensive experience who will be able to help out in the newsroom uh, and on the production side. So that's exciting. Raymond show is ensconced there. We've already started to shoot other programs like the Robbie George uh, candidate series is happening. So that's exciting. Uh, we're going to also be uh, probably at this point in time announcing, I hope Mary uh, isn't listening, but uh, Mary Shovlin will be coming on board in January as our uh, Rome producer slash correspondent. She'll be working with the other correspondents, uh, putting together packages on a daily basis. Great. For yeah. EWTN for News Nightly. For EWTN awesome. News Nightly directly. She's wonderful. So I love working great. with her. She's great. People yeah. would have seen her during, during right. the Senate. And mm -hmm. she's, she worked here years ago. She's been a great friend of the network. And she'll be, uh, you know, supporting Alan Holdren uh, and the other reporters there and also doing reporting herself. But hopefully we'll get to the point where we can have a, a daily package. We really look to see with the show going forward, in a sense, almost kind of like the old World News Tonight thing, where we, to some degree we're, we've got an anchor desk, in a sense, out of uh, Rome. So you've got Rome every day. The White House, what's happening at the, you know, the Senate, the House of Representatives, what's happening in the studio interviews, and be able to cover all of those bases. And certainly one of the things we can bring is a Catholic angle, right. and certainly the news from Rome, which no one else but brings But see, what, what is so good about this, and, and, and the way EW10 News Nightly is done, is because you're doing all the news. You are doing the Catholic news, and obviously we're going to put that in a Catholic perspective, especially when we're talking about different uh, pieces of legislation that may affect, you know, um, some of our beliefs, whether it's marriage or or the pro-life cause, but you're also hearing about the news in general, and it's done in such a professional, non-sensational way. 
which is what I appreciate, having come from, you know, the, the secular right. media where it was, if it bleeds, it leads. And right. it's getting it, worse and worse. Exactly. And I think one of the things, too, is that sometimes in the past, and, you know, we've been accused of it and we're getting better, hopefully. You know, people go, well, you know, the Catholic religious programming's a little bit, you know, it's usually not that good or it's uh, or it's too one-sided. And, and our goal was, as you just mentioned, to, to provide a professional news experience the kind of program that somebody could go and find the truth, uh, not be insult- assaulted by images, you know, right. or or salacious stories designed well, to get you to tune in. responsible journalism. You know? Right, exactly. And Brian and his team have done that, obviously. And so for the person who's the, you know, who wants the basic news of the day, it's a great way to watch it and get a Catholic sense of what's going on. If you're a news junkie or somebody that much more involved, well, you know, it puts context on the stories. Right. You, you can you see what's on the web, you see what's on the phone during the day, and you can come to EWTN's News Nightly to kind of get another perspective or hopefully the Catholic perspective to put what they're saying on Fox or CNN or MSNBC in perspective. I just like seeing a newscast that is well done, that is professional. I mean, in addition to, to the Catholic aspect of it, where the reporters aren't screaming at me and the reporters aren't, you know, just standing in front. And, and, and Elena, of course, a journalist herself, is putting the thumbs up. And a reporter isn't just covering one shooting after one fire, after right. one snowstorm, after another. Can we please get some content and some depth, please, right. which is what... EW10 News Nightly does. Right. Since when did putting, uh, you know, reporters out in the middle of hurricanes become the major event of the the news show? But exactly. That's what we want to be able to have. In a sense, go back to the old CBS days, you know, where you had at least the idea of a a mature presentation of the news. It's information. It's interesting. Uh, It's not boring. It's not stiltified. but But it's also presented in a way that one can get through the facts rather than setting up these false dichotomies and these phony arguments where people are brought into a studio and saying, uh, okay, I've got the black side, you've got the white side, right. let's, whatever, let's we, we're going to fight back and like, forth. Exactly. Well, I'm excited about this, and I'm looking forward to, God willing, having Lauren on the show and, and chatting with her not only about the White House, but also about her experience. Doug, thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Great uh, to God see willing, you in person. Yes, amen. <laughs> Talk to you folks tomorrow from Michigan, God willing. We'll see you then. Ciao, ciao. You've been listening to Catholic Connection with Teresa Tamio. Catholic Connection is a co-production of Ave Maria Radio and EWTN Radio and carried across the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Our producer is Andrew Kruchek. For copies of this program or for more information, visit AveMariaRadio.net. That's A-V-E Maria Radio.net. Thanks for listening and join us next time for another edition of Catholic Connection. Maybe she can do it.